Hi. Um, can you let me know if you can hear me okay? I can neither, thank you. <laughs> I can neither see you nor uh, can I hear you. Uh, if you can't hear me well, um, feel free to move up. There's some seats up here at the front and around here. Um, and it would be great if you could see the screen and if you could clearly um, hear me. So I'm Sue Gardner, and for seven years, I was the executive director of the Wikimedia Foundation, which is the San Francisco-based nonprofit that operates Wikipedia. Are you holding up a sign? <laughs> Um, let's see if I can get this. So Jimmy Wales founded Wikipedia in 2001, and when he did it, he was essentially making a kind of a bet about what people were like and what they would do on the internet. And so what he was betting was that if you created a platform and you made it possible for people to come together and to share information with each other and to build an encyclopedia, that two things would happen as a, as a result of that. And one was that people would actually do it. They would come together and freely give their own time to write material for other people to benefit from. And the other bet that he was making was that the end product would be useful, right? That people would find it useful. And the passage of time has proved that both of those suppositions were true. So today, Wikipedia is the fifth most popular website in the world. It has just over half a billion readers using it regularly. Um, and it is available in 287 language versions. And if you are Finnish, I'm assuming you speak multiple languages. And so you'll know that the Finnish language Wikipedia is not a translation or a direct copy of, for example, the English Wikipedia. All the Wikipedia language versions are different, right? They're unique cultural products written by people in that language for readers in that language. There are 30 million articles in Wikipedia across all the language versions. And if you printed out Wikipedia and you made multiple books out of it and you put those books on bookshelves and you put those bookshelves into stacks, it would fill up, ordinarily I can say, it would fill up a room the size of this one. I'm not sure it would fill up this room, but it would certainly fill up this corner of this room. So it's a massive uh, endeavor. It's a massive repository of knowledge. I want to ask you a question, which is, um, and I don't know that I can see you, but can you put up your hands for me if you've actually edited Wikipedia yourself? That's really good. That's a lot more um, than what I usually see. And put up your hand if you have edited it yourself, but also if you, if you know someone personally who is a Wikipedia editor. So I would say that's maybe a quarter of the room. Most people don't know any Wikipedians, and that's because, um, as Jimmy once said, the kind of person who is going to stay home on Friday night and write an encyclopedia article is not the kind of person who is necessarily hugely social, right? So most people haven't um, met Wikipedians. So a couple years ago, we have an annual conference, and a couple years ago it was in Gdansk in Poland, and we videotaped uh, some of our volunteers and got them to talk to us about what it was like writing Wikipedia, why they did it, um, and what the experience was like for them. And so I have a very short video um, that I'm going to show you now. No, I don't have superpowers at all. No. You could you could totally do it. I pushed the button and saved the text. Ooh. <laughs> it was uh, exciting. You just changed Wikipedia. You just added your own contribution to Wikipedia. I read an article in The Guardian about this online encyclopedia which everybody can contribute to. And I thought, whoa, maybe I can contribute too as well. I edited it the first time and I think I got addicted to it. I don't get paid anything. I just do it for, you know, something to do in my free time, that's it. You may start doing it for an idea because you believe in it, but you end up with friends, you end up with uh, lovers, you end up with uh, wonderful discussions, you end up with new ideas, you end up with the new books you're going to write. You're not writing the article alone. You write a piece and somebody else goes like, hey, I have more, and together you can create articles that are pages long, which you can't buy yourself. Then you have success. You always see, okay, what I've done was successful. And this is one of, this is great because, so editing is, is a great feeling every time you do it. As I say, when I read about Wikipedia, I decided that this is maybe where I would fit in, and I did. <laughs> Aren't they great? 
I love, I love the woman who says, and then you'll have lovers. <laughs> you know, I mean, our point was to encourage people to edit Wikipedia. <laughs> um, so I want to I wanna roll back in time a little bit to the middle 90s. Um, and in the middle 90s, the people who were constructing the internet, who were conceptualizing it and imagining what it wanted to look like and what we wanted it to be, they were radical and they were visionaries. And so this is the Declaration of the Independence of Cyberspace, which was written in 1996 by John Perry Barlow of the EFF. And it's a kind of a manifesto. And one of the things that John Perry Barlow was imagining when he was thinking about the future of the internet was he wanted it to be something that was freed from the constraints of the physical world, right? He wanted it to be a thing that would be borderless. And I think that years later, that's exactly what we saw happen. Um, it came to fruition with Wikipedia. We saw, you know, the guy from India, there was a Russian woman, a Dutch woman, uh, the kid from Germany. And so Wikipedia was geography collapsing, right? People coming together across borders and working with each other in real time often and collaborating to build the encyclopedia. And I think that more recently now, we're beginning to see that changing. And what we're beginning to see, especially in the past two, three, four years, is the reassertion of geographical borders over the internet. And that concept and related concepts are sometimes called things like balkanization, right, or splinterization, or simply the fragmentation of the internet. And it can be sometimes a little bit of an abstract concept and not necessarily easy for us to get our heads around for a couple of reasons, right? Because as an internet user, we are located in the geography that we're in at that moment in time. And it's not easy for us to see the experience of other people. And I think also because censorship on the internet and, and, and the balkanization of it um, is often defined more by an absence of material. Something is, is hidden from your view rather than by the presence of material. And so it's all a bit abstract. So what I'm going to do in the next couple of minutes is take you through a, a very superficial, a very brief, high-level tour of what balkanization online looks like from the perspective of the end user. <clears throat> and I'm going to start, unsurprisingly, with China. So this is the Wikipedia article about the Tiananmen Square protests, which inside China are called the um, 4th of June protests. If you are in China, in mainland China, you can't see this article. It used to be the case that inside mainland China, uh, you couldn't experience Wikipedia at all. So Wikipedia and many Western websites were um, entirely blocked in China up until just around the time of the Beijing Olympics. And in the run-up to the Olympics, the Chinese authorities loosened up the restrictions to some degree, and it became possible to see websites that previously you hadn't been able to see at all. But um, just unblocking Wikipedia doesn't unblock access to all the material on Wikipedia, and much of the material that is available on Wikipedia is not visible to people inside China. If you're in China, you cannot see this, and you can't see a lot of the Western Internet. <clears throat> this is a map of India. If you are physically located in India, you are not supposed to be allowed to see this version of the Indian map. So what this is, is it is the um, map of India as, as defined by the United Nations. And so you can see the dark green is undisputedly Indian geography. And the lighter green at the top and just the western top of the map is the borders with Pakistan, the borders with China. And those borders are disputed. And so there are different views of reality of who owns what of that territory. If you're inside India and you're using Wikipedia, you can see this version of the map, even though technically it is not legal for Wikipedia to show it to you. But if you're inside India and you're using any one of a number of other web services, if you're using, for example, Google Maps or sites like that, what you're going to see is the map of India with the borders of India as defined by the Indian government. You can't access this. This is a very bad heavy metal album from 1976 from a group called The Scorpions. They're a German band. And this album is called Virgin Killer. In 2009, a coalition of internet service providers in the United Kingdom decided that that image was child pornography and that they didn't think that anybody in the United Kingdom should be allowed to see it. And so what they did was they blocked access to that Wikipedia article. And for four days, uh, the people of the United Kingdom freaked out and screamed and yelled and talked to the media about how they didn't want Wikipedia blocked for them. They wanted to be able to see the whole of Wikipedia, everything that was on it. 
And so that coalition of ISPs backed down and they reinstated people's access to see this article. But when they did it, what they said was, the only reason they were backing down is because Wikipedia is enormously popular and they can't fight it. It's too big, it's too important, people love it too much. They still think that this image shouldn't be visible to people inside the United Kingdom, and they continue to block access to all kinds of material that they think it's not in the interest of the people of the United Kingdom to be able to see. We have one more stop on our tour, and this is Finland. So, um, Folks here, are you familiar with the book about Sonora that was published anonymously online about 10 years ago, I think, or maybe a little bit more? So um, I am not an expert in this, but my understanding is that uh, an anonymous person wrote and published on the internet a book about Sonora, which was at the time, I think, the national uh, mobile firm, the National Telecom, and it's since merged with the Swedish National Telecom. And um, the book was about alleged financial um, bad practices at Sonora. And um, it was published on the internet, and then I think later also published in book form inside this country. I need to ask you another question. Are you guys familiar with the right to be forgotten? A little bit? A few people? Okay. So um, last May, the European Union issued a ruling which was intended to be privacy protective. And the idea of it was, if you had done something bad in your history, and it was years and years and years later, you had some ability, you should have some ability to remove that information from the internet. So you weren't constantly haunted by a mistake that you'd made in your youth. And so they created a process whereby people could petition search engines to have results removed from search engines if they were harmful to you as an individual. So when I'm at home in my house in San Francisco, I can Google Sonora book and I can get this article on the Finnish Wikipedia. If I'm inside Europe and I do that same Google search, this doesn't come up for me. It's been removed from the Google results because somebody petitioned to have it taken down. We don't actually know who petitioned because Google's not supposed to tell people. And so what that means is that a piece of your country's history, right, is, is lost to you. You can't see it anymore. I mean, there are ways around it. There are ways that you can see it, but you're not able to find it simply through Google results the way that you would have been prior to May. So, I think it used to be the case that we all had one internet experience, for the most part. And the countries that were kind of walling themselves off from the internet, so China, Burma, um, North Korea, we, we hoped in the early days, we hoped that those countries would join us and come into the free and open internet. But I think that what we're seeing today instead of that is we're seeing various um, institutions and authority figures, police sometimes, sometimes people's governments, sometimes your ISP or an industry coalition, an industry group. What we're seeing is them exercising some authority over what we're able to see online. And I think, you know, there's a number of reactions people could have to that. Like you could kind of think, I don't really care about the Sonora book, it's not a big deal to me. Or you could think, you know, um, I'm anti-censorship, but I also believe that different cultures are different and maybe I'm not the one to say what other countries should be able to do or not do on the internet. And you know, I, I get that. But in my view, um, I think that m what my gut tells me to do is I think that our original vision of the internet was the correct one. And I think that it's one that we ought to stand up for today. And the reason I say that is because when I look at something like Wikipedia, Wikipedia is purely a product of the free and open and borderless internet. It's a place where people can come together across geographic boundaries without any impediments and they can work together. And they do. Arabic people working with Jewish people on the articles about the Middle East, right? We see people coming together, not just constructing knowledge, not just constructing um, an encyclopedia, but learning from each other and creating common cause and a better sense of understanding among all of us. I think that's what the internet is for, and I applaud it, and I think it's awesome, and I think we should stand up for that. Thank you.